Can you hear me out there okay? Good. Well, I want to go ahead and get started and uh, just preface my remarks a little bit by thanking those of you who are here for coming down. I had anticipated we'd have a few more, but uh, there's some conflicting things. Unfortunately, Ruby Chow's uh, art exhibit is on tonight, and we didn't know that when we set the meeting up. I've extended my formal apologies to Ruby, and she says, forget about it. <laughs> but uh, we have a, a number of our people have gone to that and aren't here tonight. And we have five units that are empty throughout the mutual. They won't be here tonight. And we have several people who are not well, and they won't be here tonight. So we are what we are. It's a group, and I appreciate your coming out and, and uh, helping us to initiate this first salvo and trying to understand more about solar energy and what our mutual may or may have not have in terms of involvement for that. First, I want to point out that this is not a business meeting. We're not taking minutes. We're not get a, a, going to conduct any business at this meeting. There won't be any votes taken. But it is an informational and educational tool that we want to use to, to let you know what the committee that we have formed has been trying to come up with and some of the ideas and some of the problems and things that we're going to have to face if we decide to go forward. I think it's probably a fair statement to say that uh, solar is the wave of the future, but the future is now. And I think that means that we have to look at it and decide. We're a small mutual, and so our, our task can sometimes be easier because we're small and can make our own decisions. Large mutuals are, are struggling with the idea, but they're having all kinds of problems. I can tell you, I go to the president's forum once a month where the presidents all get together in the act. And, um, and basically what comes out of that is uh, that Large mutuals are very, very difficult to run. I, I, I can tell you, you don't have any idea how thankful I am to be in a small mutual. Some things aren't so good. We have to we kind of struggle a little bit to get people to be on the board. and We kind of struggle a little bit financially a year or so ago and had to do a special assessment. But I'd trade that any day for the daily problems that go on in terms of the uh, large mutuals. Um, the Solar Committee, we, uh, the board of directors appointed a Solar Committee what, six, months, uh, six weeks, eight weeks ago, something like that. And it was, we appointed uh, Norm King to be the chairperson of that committee. And uh, on the committee are Richard Pancoast and uh, Bill Van Lack and uh, myself and Chief Ewing. Uh, I'm ex officio, they won't let me vote. They try to restrict my talking. <laughs> That's sort of an impossibility. Um, this committee has met several times, and we've identified many potential hurdles that have to be uh, addressed. And we're going to share some of those with you tonight. It's important to know that at this stage of where we are, that the committee needs to have mutual residents give their permission to proceed with what we're trying to do in order for us to, to get into the dirty the details of where we're at and what we need to accomplish. We haven't done uh, any accurate cost appraisals yet of what we're talking about. We're dealing in theory right now. And part of the reason for that is that we, I don't want to, as a president of Mutual, want to expend a lot of monies for legal opinions and other types of things that cost money until we find out if the mutual wants to proceed with it. So that's the purpose of tonight's meeting is to, is to see. And again, we're not taking a vote tonight. We will um, uh, try to address the questions that we've come up with, and then we will be planning to send a survey out in a few days, a non-binding survey. It's not a vote, it's not a ballot, but it's an interest survey to survey all of the residents to find out how many people are interested in pursuing it, how many are not, where we're at, and what we're doing. Uh, without that uh, sort of semi-approval to go ahead, the committee will probably just fade away until some other time. Some of the issues that we have looked at in the committee 
have to deal with the exclusive use provision of common area space, essentially meaning the rooftops of buildings and possibly including the carport and garage roofs. You don't have uh, a feasible or ground space, which is common area, is not adequate to provide putting solar panel arrays out on what little lawn that we have. There's not a, most of the buildings that have southern exposure uh, wouldn't be able to provide, plus then you have to wire each building. It's not feasible for us to look at, at least according to the committee, to look at putting solar panels on ground areas. So we're looking at the rooftops of all the nine buildings and possibly some carports and garages. Uh, other things that we've looked at and issues had to do with the aesthetics of this. Uh, people in entry 20 will be looking down on the roofs of entry 19, which they do now. And they're not particularly beautiful roofs as they are now, but they are roofs. And those would be occupied by panels. And our presentation will cover that a little bit later on. Another problem that we've confronted is what is the equitable use of these common spaces? How much available space do we have? What's our capacity to produce it? Can we accomplish, uh, can we accommodate anybody who wants to have it or do we have to limit it to certain percentages? Those are the problems, that, one of the problems. And we have not gone into costs specifically. The advantages of solar power, of course, are that, uh, as you all know, electric costs are going to continue to skyrocket. And we're an all electric unit, so it will affect us significantly. One of the important things about installing solar now is, and there have been a lot of studies that show that, that if and when it comes time to resale a unit that has solar installation already, there's a huge return on your investment in terms of the increased selling price. The Berkeley study was done two or three years ago that looked at residential improvement to their house, and most of them went up something to the tune of thirty or forty thousand dollars up just by having solar availability. So that's something to consider. So those are just the opening comments that I would like to make. And at this time, I'd like to introduce to you Mr. Rob Cassidy, who's their representative from Semper Solaris. And he's going to give us a video or a slide presentation on solar and what solar panels are and so on. So welcome, Mr. Cassidy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we had some technical difficulties, so I have brought a Mac, and apparently it wasn't compatible. So <laughs> I will uh, open up slides, but uh, I am a local native, uh, San Francisco born uh, Bay Area, and I'm a true energy geek. So hopefully the, the goal is to answer any questions you may have. Um, and I'm just going to break it down to who we are as a company. Um, Sun Power, how many people have heard of Sun Power, if I may ask? Just, okay, so. Yeah, and generally, if you do know of Sun Power currently, you've already done due diligence to to get there because uh, they're they're definitely above and beyond. Um, and then the most important thing, I actually uh, grabbed some screenshots from my PG&E bill. I've owned solar for three years, uh, so you can actually, in my opinion, uh, 12 years into this, that's the most misunderstood uh, aspect of solar. How does it interact with your PG&E bill? And it sounds great, I'm selling all that energy back at one o'clock in the afternoon. What does that mean in dollars and cents? Right? And, and what does it look like? So that was my goal, is to grab some screenshots. So I'll try not to inundate, um, but I'm just going to go over this. I'm going to be interacting with this computer a little bit. Um, and then any questions you have, please ask. If I don't know the answer, uh, hopefully John will, or Norm. <laughs> and if not, I will get, I'll get you the answer. Okay, so uh, Semper Solaris, we've been around since 1979. Uh, we are and started off as a vet-owned and operated local company uh, out of San Diego. Uh, it's not a prerequisite to be a veteran. <clears throat> I am an Army vet, uh, and 98% of our company are vets, um, so, but it's not a prereq. Uh, but it's important to us because, in my opinion, uh, American-made uh, panels, framing, uh, and the best warranty in the uh, industry, Sun Power, is, uh, is critical. Um, 
we started off in 89 doing roofing and solar, and then five, six years ago, the market got flooded with the Chinese panels, Taiwanese Chinese panels. Uh, if you all remember Solyndra, do you remember down in Fremont? Um, yeah, they kind of got pushed out. Their goal was to flood the market with these panels at under cost, kill their competition, and then buck the price up. And what happened was, the panels were of such poor quality that the oxidation in salt air, primarily on uh, coastal installations, loosened the wiring underneath the panel, and animals were getting killed uh, underneath, birds, cats, things like that. Uh, so the code in 2011 went from 15 inches off of a roof down to six. So if you're driving around looking at installations locally, you can kind of tell an older installation by how far it is off the roof. There are some exceptions, but as a rule. Um, so that's kind of what started Semper's uh, drive into making sure that we were offering the best panels, the best, best product, best price, and the best warranty. Okay. Um, John had mentioned that price is going up for PG&E, and what we like to do is be conservative. As a company, we are conservative. Um, but not to go into too much detail, because it can be boring, in my opinion, PG&E. Um, the increases that have been approved, everybody is familiar, we've had three increases since September, three. Um, the PUC controls tier ones and two. And those are what they call control tiers. Currently in Rossmore, that's 17 cents and 18.9 cents a kilowatt, tier one and two. Tier three and four are controlled by PG&E, and those are what they call abuser tiers, people that they feel are abusers. And it's completely, and I'm gonna just share my opinion, it's completely backwards modeling. If you're going to PG&E's gas station, you're gonna pay 350 for your first four gallons, four dollars for your next four, seven dollars for your next four, and eight dollars for your final four. It's just backwards business, but that's the way we operate. So if you're wondering how that happens, why, why do my bills go up randomly almost? The Public Utility Commission controls tier one and two. Those go up seven percent a year for the next 25 years, already approved. So that's only tier one and two. Anybody that can speculate on tier three and four is, is just doing that, speculating. Uh, last year, tier three and four went up 28%. We use 10% as a, as a conservative average. So if you're wondering, or this is really important for factoring and a return on investment, because if you're gonna invest in solar, you should have a return on investment at about five and a half years, maybe six years or less. So, and I'll be glad to answer questions on that later, but I just, that's kind of, so if you can see here, if your average bill at the top, let's just say 100, you can see that by year one, you've paid 1320, by year 10, it's 3112. That's, uh, that is tier one and two control. So to John's point, the rates are going up and we know that, so. But hopefully, does that make sense in layman's terms, hopefully? Okay. And if it doesn't, just shut up. <laughs> All right. Now, the, the panels that uh, we carry are uh, they're by a company called SunPower. Um, SunPower started in 1975 in, on Stanford. They were invented on Stanford. Over 200 patents held, 212 to be specific. Um, this panel here is this panel. Uh, it's kind of confusing when you look at it like that because uh, you guys have all seen panels with the little squares, correct? Yeah. Um, SunPower's lower wattage panels used to look like that. But since 2012, this is what they look like, all black. 
And I have some other photos I can show you. Uh, Sun Power boasts quite a few things, but to keep it simple, um, 345 watts a panel, and 250 for most other panels out there. Sometimes 275, sometimes. But 250 as a rule. Uh, the degradation warranty, that's how, how fast does a panel go bad? Like how fast, a lot of people go, well, I'm gonna get panels in 10 years from now, it's gonna, it's gonna be bad. Um, every other panel in the open market has a, what they call it a degradation. It actually goes down in percentage, 1% degradation per year for 25 years. So the production goes down. Um, Sun Powers is 0.4% per year for 25 years. Um, but the common question I get more so is, well, how long do you think they'll last? And it's, solar is kind of new, right? I mean, 84, uh, 1984, there was a, Sa a Sacramento Municipal Utility District. They had an installation with Sun Power. Those panels, we go up there every year when we get relicensed. We show the new guys how to do the maintenance on them. and uh, They're at 94.5% production 31 years later. Okay, so fair to say they beat their, their warranty. <laughs> um, the biggest thing with uh, Sun Power when it comes to residential is the warranty, the 25-year bumper-to-bumper labor workmanship warranty. And regardless of what you're considering when you're looking at panels, you really have to dig, in my opinion, when it comes to the uh, labor warranty, because you'll hear 25 years, 25 years, which I just told you, which is a degradation warranty, but they're different. The production warranty is 1% per year for 25 years in 97% of the panels out there. The Germans have some panels that are 0.75, but as a rule, 1%. Sun Powers is 0.4%, 0.4% degradation. Okay. Are Sun Powers higher priced because they're more efficient? Uh, yeah, as a rule, that is correct. So, um, and this is where I feel we have an edge. Um, all of us, at the time the market got flooded, uh, we were working in solar. I've been doing it for 12 years personally. And our owner, Kelly, and a gentleman by the name of David Depew at Sun Power used to serve together at Camp Pendleton. And uh, we call those brotherly ties in the military, but uh, they're, they're important. And the, uh, we don't have fancy offerings like iPads and you know, flip charts and stuff, but uh, when you buy 388 pallets every three months and turn them, uh, you can get a good price. And that's our... Yeah, Okay, the question is, how does our degradation rate compare with others in regards to efficiency, correct? Is that correct? Yeah. Um, Sun Power, and I'll, I'll pull that up. Actually, you can kind of see it right there, but um, it'll reflect in a video I have at the end. Well, in a Sun Power panel, to simply put, if a leaf hits a panel, a leaf touches a panel of every other panel out there, that we call them non-patented panels. Um, it's going to take down 25% or more of that panel in production. If a leaf hits a sun power panel, there's 92 chips per panel, it'll render that chip useless only. So you'll have at least 87% or more of that panel working at any given time. Yeah. Does that answer that? Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, You'll have fewer panels per installation too. That, yeah, that's a good point. You'll have fewer panels per installation. And that's a good point. We run, that's probably one of the most common things we run up into where people will say, hey, you know, I was told I need 24 panels to take care of my usage. And that's, there's two, that's a two-prong uh, concern. But the main one is 345 watts per panel for sun power and a 250 watt, let's say a Ying Li, or a Taiwanese Canadian panel, excuse me, even Solar World out of Oregon are 250. You just don't need as many. So there's, that's a good point. 
Yes. You said something about labor, but you didn't talk. I mean, okay, if there's a year. If there's a warranty on the panel, what happens to the labor if it has to be done? Yeah. You mentioned labor, but I don't know if you continue. Nice. Excuse me. Um, bumper to bumper. So for any reason, if that panel needs to be serviced in that 25-year period, uh, if you're an elite sun power dealer, as Semper is, we have exclusive rights to that warranty for 10 years. So we will come out. Take, if, let's say the panel's bad as an extreme, which by the way, in 12 years, I've never seen a sun power panel go bad. 12 years. Let's just say it goes yeah. bad. But let's say it goes bad. We will take it down, ship it back, reinstall the new one, bumper to bumper, okay. at no cost. Right. Now after 10 years, the reason why I wanted to mention that is if Walnut Creek Solar, right down the street, let's say, uh, they're an elite uh, sun power dealer, uh, and they're closer in proximity, they can be dispatched to service your panel what, rather than us because we're in Hayward. We have a satellite office in Hayward. And it, it, you said that it will, there's no charge for how many years? 25. Oh, the whole 25. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Sharper? <laughs> yeah, that, that I don't know. I, I, let's see if I can help out. <clears throat> Yeah, so let me see if I, uh, if this video, we can sharpen it during here. Hopefully this will help. In the real world, solar panels regularly undergo partial shading. Sticks, leaves, dust, even bird droppings. And what happens when a solar panel is partially shaded? That depends on which solar panel. For some, a shaded cell can lead to significant power loss. Why? Because a shaded solar cell can't generate power, and it can't properly pass the power generated by its unshaded neighbor cells. Instead, it dissipates that power, resulting in additional power loss for the entire panel. For this conventional panel, partial shading on just one cell shuts down a third of the entire panel. But SunPower is designed differently. SunPower's patented Maxion cell technology is optimized with built-in protection so that if and when a leaf, or anything else, shades a cell, only the shaded cell powers down, resulting in far less power loss. Let's look at the power output of two panels under shading in this experiment. SunPower panels are more efficient than conventional panels to begin with, so they produce more power. Now let's see what happens when we shade a small portion of the panel. Sun power is operating at 89%, while the conventional panel is down to 66%. And if shading continues over time, a conventional front contact panel will fail, resulting in 100% power loss. But Sun Power's Maxion technology has built in protection for each cell, ensuring consistent power production even if shading continues. Bottom line, Sun Power panels are designed for the real world, and Sun Power's exhaustive testing ensures that their systems perform consistently, hassle free, for well over 25 years. Sun Power, designed for life in the real world. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Yeah? Um, we have an issue with geese here. Yes. Uh -huh. We haven't had them, I don't think, on my roof yet, but they will come. What happens if the geese decide to nest? on one of these panels. Right. Um, well, and that's interesting because sun power panels can be cool to touch even during the summer. Um, without getting too uh, geeky about it, uh, the, a sun power panel, the 345 watt panel, is a 335 watt panel. How's that for confusion? What they, what they do is they take a white layering in the back of it and they put it behind it and it attracts a little more sun Primarily, it keeps the panel cool to the touch. So the geese would like it. Geese, geese could land on it, right? Um, however, uh, you know, where we've, where we've had that, like the Dega Bay, we've had droppings oh, yeah. affect uh, uh, productivity. Um, so here, here's a cool thing. Uh, you get on your, uh, and I have it on my phone, I'll be glad to show you afterwards, monitoring. Monitoring is on your phone or your device, on the computer. Uh, so the days of having to walk out to the inverter to look at, at um, how much you're producing are kind of over. Uh, you'll know instantly in, in, on your phone. What I like to do is I'll, well, I like to watch, for instance, in um, uh, your building, Norm, just because I know it off the top of my head, I think it was a 97% harvest, 97.5% harvest. What that means is, where in Norm's building, uh, 
based off the lack of shading implication, it, it was optimal. So, and it was optimal placement. However, let's say it's 97.4, we install it June 1st. Uh, there's no rain. Let's say there's no rain. All of a sudden, August, September 1st comes, let's say, and it's gone from 97 down to 92% harvest. Uh, the minute it clips below 4%, uh, we monitor your system for you. SunPower monitors it, and you monitor it. We look for that slow decline, because if you have that, we're going to uh, email you first. If you're non-responsive in 72 hours, we'll call you and set up a service call. And that service call is a hose. <laughs> and I, I'm not kidding. I know I'm, I'm 51, but I bring out these. Uh, I remember them from the 80s, but they're uh, it's a connection on a hose that looks like a little fire hydrant. And when you turn them, uh, they shoot about 48 feet, 48 to 52 feet of water. Um, you want to do it quick, obviously, we're in a drought, but literally within three. And what's really neat is that as you're cleaning them, you'll watch the uptick on your uh, phone. It's really cool. But if it rains, if it rains, that's it. That's, my, that's service. Also, they would, be, they would be installed at an angle, so maybe goose eggs would roll off. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> Leaf analogy is mm -hmm. the leaf is blown away, does it go back to full capacity? Yes. On both the conventional and sun power. That would happen on either. Yeah. Yeah. Um, clothing, big wheels tied to the panels, uh, kids sleeping on them. I mean, in 12 years I've come across a lot of crazy things, but uh, those are not going to, I don't think those are going to happen in Rossmore. <laughs> Fair to say. So. All right. Any other questions on that? On that? <laughs> okay. Um, Here, I just want to show you uh, some installations that I just pulled this off that we've done recently. Hopefully, you see that okay? Um, yeah. So, this is a uh, Solar World. We used to do Solar World back in like 2007, uh, and that's Sun Power. Uh, it's hard to kind of see, I guess. Hopefully, you can see, but. The idea of it being all black, um, you heard in the video they said Maxian cell technology, but if you go home and Google Apple Campus, or what they call the mothership, the new Apple Campus is completely round. And uh, SunPower, uh, we're doing 14,600 panels on that complex. That complex is going to be fossil fuel free. It's really neat, kind of a cutting edge. The point to this is that the, the actual chip can bend. And in my world, that's amazing. Because when I started, you even touched a chip and it crumbled to pieces. So it's really, really amazing, the technology, just in the last uh, 10 to 12 years. But that's kind of the profile. This is all to code. That's called a ground mount in the bottom right. Uh, I think you guys are looking at doing the megawatt system. That's kind of what it's going to look like, but maybe bigger. <laughs> uh, the one on the bottom right-hand corner. They call that a ground mount. Um, I will say, just in our experience, the ground mount systems require much more, not just more, but much more maintenance. They're more susceptible to dust, uh, gatherings, things like that. Uh, and the rooftop, again, just uh, rainwater. you done any parking lot installations? Uh, yeah. Down south of junior college. Yeah. The parking lot. Yeah, yeah. Um, I am a uh, member of the Inner Solar uh, Community. That's the, uh, they get together at the Moscone Center every, every June. And uh, we do uh, volunteer work. So the question was, do we do any parking complexes and such, maybe commercial and schools and things? Uh, we volunteer to do that. We're not commercial installers per se, uh, but we do volunteer for, for that. Castor Valley High School, close to where I live, we installed 140 panels. On, and built the infrastructure. And I think to John's point earlier, if I may uh, add on to that like a baton, um, yeah, parking structure, uh, you know, isn't the most pretty thing to look at. But when you're looking at black panels on a parking structure, uh, <laughs> it's a lot lower profile and kind of covers all the dings. The other cool thing about doing that is that it keeps the heat it actually, and same thing on a, in a home, by the way. Uh, wherever those panels are installed, it prevents insulation from the sun. So 
So if you have a part of your home that gets hot be, during the day, it would be insulated because of solar. Probably 15 to 20 degrees, but no more than that. What about adequate roof load? Is roof load adequate? Weight, the weight yeah. load. Yeah, the structure, uh, if, it, if the uh, uh, building or the construct is to code, meaning usually uh, there's rafters 18 inches off center. Every 18 inches there's a rafter. Uh, there is not a roof you could put too many panels on. Uh, the pan now in 2002 when I started, the weight of a panel was 96 pounds to 114. Uh, current day, it's 46 pounds. Yeah. I just say that's one of the things that if we decide to continue on with this, then we will get feasibility studies and they'll have engineers come out and look at our plans and inspect our roofs to give us the, the, the solar people can't install beyond what the engineering people and permits will allow them to do. So we think that the roofs are adequate, but we won't know that until we get a feasibility set. We haven't done that yet. Well, John, wasn't one of the things we're going to be doing is putting new roof tiles on? So would that, that be those are the, what we do? Those are the concrete tiles on an angle. We're talking about up on the dura last, the flat parts of all the roofs. Just the flat parts, not the curved part. Well, that's a good question, if I might answer that. Yeah. Uh, we have, as you know, five years ago, six years ago, we put on new Duralast membranes. They're warrantied for 15 years. And anything that penetrates that voids the warranty. Ah, we ask that question. And the answer to that question is that the solar installators, when they come out to install, they notify the Duralast company. The Duralast people send their representatives out and work with whatever company puts it in. They have devised a technique where they can penetrate through and seal the penetration so that the warranty continues. And, uh, and so that part, we were very concerned about that because of the warranty. And the same thing happens if the Duralast at the end of 15 or 20 years starts to go bad before the panels go bad, then the same thing happens. They will come out during the, when we take the panels down, put new Duralast down, the Duralast people and the solar companies will work together to redo the roof as it was before. So I, I think we've sort of solved that. But we have to pay to take the panels down. Well, I'm so assuming, we I, I think yes, that's part of the thing. You'd have to reinstall the, the cost. Go ahead, I'm sorry. No, I was good. we just did a uh, Duralast installation starting Monday in Santa Cruz. And the warranty, specifically, they have a representative that basically watches the installation, verifies it's you know done properly. Uh, it's pretty straightforward, but there's some sealing and things like that specific, uh, more just to protect the homeowner. Um, however, on the membrane roofs, when we've done installations, like in 2004 when membrane installation started, um, likewise, the panels protect the roof from the elements, so you have an added form. So if you have a 15-year warranty, um, there's a, in SoCal, there's an installation that we did in 2005, um, and we layered his roof, layered meaning we basically, he couldn't have enough solar. He actually didn't have enough room for his usage, but we just did what we could. Um, yeah, but chances are he'll never have a concern with his warranty again. <laughs> yeah, it would have, he'd be hard pressed, so. Okay, I uh, just wanted to show you, getting back to your question regarding the warranty to 25 years, um, it's just really important as you're you know, investigating solar and researching it, just really uh, tie down uh, all of the labor and all of the workmanship because 96% of the panels out there do not have that. And when I say 96, uh, uh, there, which I won't go into, I'll be glad to answer the questions afterwards regarding leasing. Not a huge proponent of that, and there's no, absolutely no benefit to the homeowner to lease um, in regards to tax credits and things like that. Um, the leasing companies will uh, say they're going to maintain your panels. And in three and a half years that I've had panels, I haven't even rinsed my panels off, and that's Castro Valley. So, the maintenance on panels, again, twice a year, rainwater. That's it. Um, you talked about tapping 
mentioned the word right now, tax credit. Isn't mm -hmm. the tax credit going to be over by the end of the year or something? 2016. 2016. 2016. So our decisions have to be within this, or would be better? Yes, they, the, the units have to be up and, and so uh, have running. So we decision by the, by two months. So we, well, we have to have a decision as soon as we have. About 18, eight, about 18 months. 18 months, okay, thank you. Yeah, it's a one-time issuance, and then it could roll over. I will say as a caveat, because the tax code is flawed. I could elaborate on that later. I could explain <laughs> why. Um, <laughs> like a lot of them are, I guess. There's a lot of tax codes flawed. Um, no one knows if you're issued that credit on December 31st of 2016. As it's worded currently, no one knows, and no one can answer specifically if that tax credit is going to expire in April of 2017. Um, right now, my wife and I have $2,300 in there three and a half years later. It just rolls over until it's exhausted. But to be transparent, no one, no one knows. Yeah. So doesn't the tax rebate or whatever is credit, it goes to an individual and not to a mutual, right? It would go to the home. Well, that's a good question. I mean, your, your roofs are commonly owned, but if it, you, it goes to the owner. Yeah, it would go to the resident owner. The resident the owner. Owner. So owns one the of the issues that we're working with right now, and we're probably going to need to have legal advice on this, is the ownership issue. Uh, because uh, I'll get a little bit more into this when, when I give my uh, uh, overview of what the team's been doing. But um, if the if it's a corporation, if the if the mutual itself owns it, the mutual doesn't pay income taxes, and so it can't use a tax credit. So it really has to go to the owner, and that's one of the reasons why uh, lease arrangements aren't all that wonderful, because the tax credit goes to the uh, the person that is leasing the equipment to the uh, owner or to the resident. So uh, that's that's another draw. All right. Was there another question? This may have been answered before, but uh, is it an all or nothing situation that uh, every homeowner we would all have to go in on this no. or or no. none? Um, Norm will cover that when he gives his talk in just a little bit. Let's focus. Norm, on Norm's going to answer that, I guess, in just a minute. Okay, so I just want to go over the billing process, my favorite part, because I, I own solar. <laughs> um, from uh, December 12th, 2011, my PG&E bill has been zero. And I size my system like we, we advocate, and I think uh, Norm could attest, even before we knew that you know, th this was going to become a, a bigger project. We only really advocate taking care of 25 to 80 percent, I'm sorry, 75 to 80 percent of your bill, uh, and there's, I'll explain exactly why. The first thing that happens when you decide to go forward, you fill out a net metering application, an interconnection. We submit this down to a San Jose office because we've been going there for about 12 years, and we get it approved the following morning. What this means is PG&E currently has to take out your smart meter and they have to give you a meter that goes in both directions, also commonly called a net meter or a bi-directional meter. So it allows you to sell back during the day at a high rate and buy back at night for a low rate. Do they pay for that? What's that? Does PG&E pay for that? Yeah, yeah, they're required uh, okay. with an arm bent and some... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> not happily. Not happily. Uh, there's a cap. And I just wanted to say, because I know I was at that solar meeting, uh, John, regarding the commercial project, I was blown away about how educated everybody here was on solar. So I don't want to insult anybody's intelligence. I'm just letting you know, as you look at this, it's a 5% cap on this net meter. In PG&E's territory, in all the domestic U.S., anybody that goes solar in the USA, currently, as of today, will get a net meter except in PG&E's territory. Once the 5% cap is hit, then you'll have to give your excess energy back to PG&E. And as you know, that's not, yeah, that's not gonna happen. So that's where Tesla's coming right up behind PG&E and making them mad, 
and we got the battery backup program. You're going to have alternatives, is my point. My point. Yes, sir. The battery backup. I can charge my batteries at night. I had a yes, sir. low rate, so I'm back to the high rate. Correct. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Um, so I just wanted to show you that it's called it's called NEM. Uh, NEM stands for Net Energy Metering. It's a term you're probably going to hear more and more. And on KGO, KSFO this week, and actually last week as well, uh, you're going to hear that uh, the, there's a great argument going before the Public Utility Commission. And I should be able to take my solar credit that I get and apply it to my gas bill. As of right now, we can't. But uh, in your case, you're all electric, is that correct? You wouldn't benefit, but your friends and family may. <laughs> All right, so what I did is I just took some screenshots and this is how solar impacts your bill. How are you calculating that 5% uh, What they do is 5% uh, of PG&E's uh, entire customer base that goes solar. Uh, they, they anticipate that, we, were, we thought that it was gonna expire at the end of December last year. So, that's what kind of prompted us to run those applications down for the homeowner because we do all the permit running anyway. It just made sense. And what was also happening to be transparent is people weren't running them down on time. So we would do an installation and six months later, you know, Mr. or Mrs. Jones would not have run that. They're not benefiting from their solar fully, you know. So the net meter, once that's issued to you, it allows you to sell back and this changes, but I'll just tell you what current rate is. 26 cents from nine to one, called partial peak. One to seven is 32 cents, that's called peak. And in the evening, I currently buy back for nine cents. Now this changes three times a year, it drives me crazy. But the bottom line is, and I'll show you what my bill is, uh, I'm selling back during the day. So this was my usage in April, uh, 2010 to March 2011. So you can see I was just hovering kind of to where, you, you kind of, well John actually you were more at this level. I think you were a little below. But you'll see that. So which line did you? Yeah. Oh thank you. I, uh, right. <laughs> what? You don't know? <laughs> right. Because this, this uh, algorithm they call it drives me crazy. The, thank you though. The blue is me. Uh, the gray is all similar homes. And the green is what I like to uh, affectionately call the guilt bar. That's efficient homes, where I should be. <laughs> so that's, yeah, that's what that is. And currently, everybody has that on their pg and &E login. Um, so what happens to that bar when you go solar is this. I just pulled this up from the other day. Okay. Um, so you'll hear a solar window. Um, December 20th is the shortest day of the year, June 20th, the longest. So during the summer, during the summer, my solar, you can see, kicked in at 7 a.m., maybe a little before, by the lack of bar there. And I'm up early, I get up at 4.45 every day. So I'm selling back in my home, I'm banking. And for this, every four kilowatts that I sell during the day at one o'clock, I can buy 16 back in the evening. 16 kilowatts in the evening. So this one bar at one o'clock paid for all of that. And all of this is credit. Sounds like I could make a bunch of money, doesn't it? <laughs> I'm gonna get rich, right? But if you look to the right, this is one of the funniest things pg and &E ever did. Um, uh, how many people lived here in the 90s? A lot of people? Okay. pg and &E told us to, to conserve energy and do laundry before 9 and after 7. Remember that? I still meet people to this day that believe it's, more, it's less expensive to do laundry before 9 and after 7. But if you look at your bill, you'll realize that's not true. Uh, if you apply common sense to that, those meters were manual back then, 
And PG&E didn't have a clue what time of the day we were using uh, energy. What they were doing is they were getting ripped off from Enron and they were programming us. And here we go again. So when you go solar, they tell you that for every kilowatt I sell, they're only gonna give me four cents per kilowatt in a check. So what the way it works, and I'll, I, I'll pull it up in a moment, for every kilowatt that I sell back to PG&E, I wanna use that. I wanna run my IEC, I wanna use space heaters, I am not gonna let PG&E have it at the end of the year. Right, because they only give you four cents a kilowatt. So the point to this is that if I can buy 16 kilowatts in the evening, I'm selling this kilowatt during the day at 32 cents a kilowatt, 32 cents. And PG&E is telling me, programming in my opinion, they're only gonna give me four cents. There's no value there. And that's why it doesn't make sense to over panel. It absolutely makes no sense. Matter of fact, just seeing that, doesn't that make sense? That you would under panel and the reason I have so much credit is because I have two sons and my youngest son moved out last year. So when I paneled my home, I was taking my sons into consideration. So I need to get a hot tub. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Is there any guarantee that that meeting will continue? Uh, no, again, the, once the 5% cap is hit, um, PG&E does not have leverage currently in the public uh, court of opinion. Uh, they just got hit with a $1.6 billion fine from the state three weeks ago. Um, but that's speculation. But yeah, as of right now, it's gone after the 5%. So you want to get used to that. I call that visualize. Zero. <laughs> it's a great, great view, isn't it? Zero. Can you say something? Yes, sir. When you log, if you have a PG&E account and you want to see those graphs, yeah. click on this link here that says great plans and options. And I'll give you a graph of what you want to be looking at. Yeah. Thanks, Norm, because actually the, 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 the selling back during the day, I should have specified, it's called time of use. Time of use. So the minute you get your uh, final inspection, we also go down to PG&E and change your billing for you to time of use. Because that's, that's when you're going to get the full benefit. All right, so when you go solar, there's two things. If you look at the uh, top of this screen, you'll see it says solar summary, my dashboard, okay? We're in my dashboard right now. So, and this is just for general knowledge, but this 876 kilowatt average was from 2011. This will never change. This is my monthly average. Uh, the year prior, I went solar. So what's funny about this is when you start your period, your monthly uh, billing period, April 16th, it, it'll say, oh, you're on track to spend $20. And then four days later, it goes down to $10. And then $4. But what's really funny is when it all of a sudden PG&E owes you money, they, sh they get rid of the money sign and they put percentage. <laughs> and I'm not kidding, but you can see it right there. Um, so you want to know what it equates to dollars and cents. And this is the last slide I think I have a billing. You want to look at this. And remember, I just started, I went solar December 22nd when I applied, but it took obviously a couple months for the installation. So this is my statement, year to date so far. I have a $9 credit here and a $49 credit there, $49 in credit. But this $40, $40 in credit, that doesn't sound like a lot, does it? So it's really important to know, based on that screen you saw, how much is PG&E giving me per kilowatt? So I have to divide $40 by four cents and I come out with a thousand kilowatt hours. I'm gonna leave the AC on, period. I'm gonna burn it. Yeah, I have to burn it. You know, my wife and I use space heaters in the home in December. So you wanna burn the credit. You do not wanna end the year, because you see at the end of the 12 month period, it's a true up ending. 
if I want to end the year as close to zero as possible. And we want you to end the year at zero. Because what will happen is you're going to look at me and go, Rob, I think we overpaneled. And for us, we, that's our referral business. We take that seriously. Much better to underpanel and add a panel in a year rather than it is to feel like you need to take one away. And that's really it. That's the billing aspect of PG&E. I think uh, John talked about, um, and Richard, are you here, Richard? 